John Chow once said that one of the first things you notice when you really look at the mind is how much it lies to you. It promises happiness through the way it thinks, the way it sees things, and then it doesn't deliver. Actually, it delivers a lot of stress and suffering. Then it hopes you forget, and it promises more happiness and it delivers more stress and suffering. So you've got to learn how to uncover the facts, because of course the mind itself is making itself suffer. But all too often it refuses to admit that. So you have to pre present it with the facts, and not just the facts, but also the clear picture that it is creating its own suffering, and it would be better off if it actually admitted the truth. The John Mahabha compares meditation to running a court case, trying to get to the facts of the case, seeing who's guilty, who's innocent. You can also compare it to the activity of an investigative reporter. There was a reporter who was very famous when I was younger, who didn't go to the news conferences. Or if he did, he basically wanted to see what the latest lies were. But he spent a lot of time going over public documents, the kind of little bits and facts and numbers and things that everybody is too busy to look at, too distracted to look at, doesn't have the patience to look at. But he uncovered all kinds of things. Who was spending money for what? It was there on the public record. And as he said, because his political views didn't go with those in the mainstream. The only way he was going to get them to admit the truth was to present public facts, not just come with his theories. And it's the same way with meditation. You've got to look at the facts. What's going on in your mind right now? The Buddha says we're, we're suffering from clinging aggregates. It's not the aggregates that are clinging, it's just that clinging is so tied up in the aggregates that for the time being it's hard for us to see which is which which is the clinging, which is the aggregate. As the Buddha said, they're not totally separate, but they're not the same thing. If they were the same thing, there'd be no way to have an experience of anything at all without suffering. But it is possible for arahants, or those who have attained arahantship, to experience the aggregates without the clinging. So how are you going to figure that one out? Because it is something you have to figure out. We don't just sit here and watch and let everything become clear on its own. And one of the things we've got to learn how to do is to get some control over our thoughts, to get the mind as quiet as possible, because we're so constantly bombarded by thoughts that we don't have any opportunity to, to see the thoughts clearly. It's only when we can get the mind really still and then notice what happens when it thinks. Then we can begin to see their steps in the process. So when you're meditating, any thoughts that don't have anything to do with the, the breath are suspect. Think of them that way. And part of the mind is, but they're my thoughts. I'm used to these thoughts. Oh well, yeah, our politicians are our politicians, but they still lie. And so you want to figure out where the lies are and where the truth is. So you step back, try to get the mind as still as you can, and catch it as it tries to slip off. In the beginning, you're, you'll find that you've slipped off for a long time before you realize you've gone. But as you get better and better at this, you get quicker. You can begin to read the, the steps. See where you're actually making choices. Sometimes they're very quick, but they are there. When you get things quiet inside, get things still, the steps begin to be clear to see. This is like pouring through the public record. 
you're going to be going after one fact after another, another one distraction after another. And sometimes you'll miss the meaning of the distraction or miss the steps, and other times you'll see them clearly. And then you go back to the breath and you begin to realize that when a thought forms, there's going to be a stirring in the energy of the breath, like a little knot. And you learn how to zap that before it turns into either thought, because there's a point where you're choosing, is this going to be a physical sensation or is I'm going to take this as to be a thought? And then the question is, a thought about what? Sometimes the topic seems to come ready-made. Other times you just say, well, here's an opportunity to think. Let's see what I can think about, what I want to think about right now. But there are choices being made. The more quickly you can zap the thought, in other words, breathe right through it, the earlier and earlier in the process you begin to see where the stages begin. And you also begin to see there's craving and there's clinging. And they're not necessarily the same thing as the thought, where the thoughts are suspect. Jamahabo talks about this a lot. When the investigation is going on, everything is suspect. But when you clear out, clearly see where the real culprits are. Then the stolen goods can be given back to their owners, and there's no more suspicion around them. In other words, your aggregates, which are the thoughts that you had to be suspicious about, you begin to realize that as long as you don't cling to them and you learn how to see where the clinging is and you can stop it, then the thoughts are okay. It's not like we're cutting off our mental processes. This is an image that seems to come very frequently that we're meditating so that we don't think, so that we don't respond, so that we don't analyze things. We're told that the less you try to figure things out, the better. But here you're actually, you've got to figure out you know, where is the step where the clinging comes in in a thought. How do you recognize it? It doesn't come with labels attached. You have to notice when this particular kind of thought comes in, what's the response in the mind? When that kind of thought comes in, what's the response in the mind? You have to be able to separate them out. Once you separate them out, then the innocent parts are innocent and they can go back home. And they're free to live their lives normally. In other words, arahants can still think, they still plan, but they've learned how to do it without the attachment. So we're not cutting off our mental faculties here. We cut them off for the time being as we get the mind into concentration. But that's because we're looking for the facts, and it's a tedious job sometimes. We, it's made easier by the fact that we learn how to stay with the breath in a way that's comfortable. But there will be a part of the mind that complains, you know, I want to think. Pleasant pleasure is nice, but it'll come and say, well, I've had enough pleasure, now I want to go back to my old habits. And this is where you've got to say no. So we're not just following our desire for pleasure. We're using pleasure to make it easier to do some difficult work, tracking down the evidence, learning how to interpret it. And do we see clearly exactly where the culprits are? Who's making the suffering? Feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, they're not making the suffering. It's the clinging. When you can separate that out, then the aggregates are freed and you're freed from them. And John Lee makes this point. He says, he talks about the different consciousnesses in, in your body. When you stop learning how to lay claim to them, you have your freedom, they have their freedom. They're no longer being commandeered in ways that go against their nature. And 
one isn't the image of the fire. The fire is burning because it's clinging. It's trapped and it's fueled because it's clinging. The fuel is not trapping it. The fire's own clinging is doing the trapping. And when it lets go, it goes out the same way. When you learn how to let go of your clinging to the aggregates, because you've seen exactly where the clinging is. And you're free, too. Everybody can live together in peace. Archons can still think, they can still have intentions, still make plans. But there's no more guilt, there's no more attempt to steal the things of nature and turn them into yours. So when you're in the stage of gathering the data, remind yourself it's not always going to be this way. Part of the mind that wants some entertainment out of its thoughts has to be placated, but at the same time you have to be strict with it. You're trying to learn the processes. How are these thoughts put together? What are the steps? Where does suffering enter into the series of steps. How can we avoid making that step? These are the things you've got to find by doing the grunt work, pouring over the public documents. Because the facts are here. They're all out in the open. This is what that investigative reporter said. The facts are there in the books. It's just people are too lazy to look in the books. They're there for anybody to see. What your mind is doing is there for you to see. But you have other agendas, or you've had other agendas in the past. There's that part of the mind that wants to stick with the old agendas. You've got a new agenda now. I'm trying to ferret out the facts of the case so you can figure out who's guilty, who's not. where you have to change your habits. Show the mind that it's suffering because it's lying to itself. If it didn't lie to itself, it wouldn't suffer. When it sees that it's actually to its advantage to admit the truth of these processes, that's when it's no longer guilty. That's when it no longer lies.